This program was made possible by a generous grant from the Parker Foundation. Gerald and Inez Parker. Romance of the Ranchos. The words bring images perpetuated in song and film of happy times, of fiestas, of caballeros dressed in outfits trimmed in silver, and their ladies twirling around a dance floor in long dresses with swirling skirts. Certainly there was that. But there were also long hours of tedious work. 300 Native Americans helped build Rancho Guajome. And there were also reports of a leading ranchero getting away with murder. At one adobe, modern visitors swear they've heard ghosts. These rancheros of North San Diego County were pioneers who lived off the land via cattle, crops, and their strength of character. After Mexico's successful revolution from Spain culminated in 1821, Mexican governors in California began distributing land grants, some of them huge, like the giant 133,000-acre Rancho Santa Margarita y Las Flores, most of which is now one of the largest Marine Corps bases in the world. And some of them were small, down now to only a few acres. Movie stars of their times played bit to major roles in the ranchos. Joan Crawford donated the big tree in the courtyard at Buena Vista, and Charlie Chaplin visited. It was owned by Margarita Fisher, a big star in silent films, and her husband, Harry Pollard, a Hollywood director. And Leo Carrillo, of Cisco Kid television fame, owned his own rancho, reflecting the heritage of his ranchero forebears. Some of the ranchos, Guajome, Buena Vista, and Carrillo, are in public ownership with tours on a regular basis. Others, like those on the Marine Base, still allow the public, but on a more restricted basis. Some owners, like Shelley Caron, schedule regular school groups to view her Maron Adobe, and others, like Pat and Karen Kelly on portions of the old Rancho Agua Edionda, still revere the adobe, part of their own private home. Much of the ranch land, including most of the current city of Carlsbad and property that was once owned by Oceanside City Councilman John Steiger, have given way to modern development. In this series, KOCT remembers the adobes and ranchos of early California. Giant Rancho Santa Margarita y Las Flores, more than 125,000 acres, is memorialized in two places on the Camp Pendleton Marine Corps base. A melted adobe, a mound about seven feet long and three feet tall at its apex, now protected by a canopy from wind and rain, constitutes what is left of probably one of the oldest adobe structures in North County. It dates back to 1823. It's incorrectly called an Asistencia, a sort of branch for Mission San Luis Rey, founded a few miles away by Spanish priests in 1798. But Daniel Page Patterson, supervisory archeologist on the base, explains that an Asistencia housed a resident priest, whereas a priest, sort of a circuit riding cleric, occasionally visited an estancia. It was more like a 19th century hostel, a way station for travelers between San Diego to the south and San Juan Capistrano to the north. The old ruined monument sits almost in view, and certainly within earshot, of the busy Interstate 5 freeway nearby. But just down the hill is the old Las Flores Ranch House. Paige Patterson and Richard Rothwell president of the Camp Pendleton Historical Society, tell its story. 
I'm Danielle Page Patterson. I'm the Cultural Resources Manager for Camp Pendleton, and I'm also the Supervisor and Archaeologist on base. Las Forest Adobe was built in 1866 to 1868 by one forester for his son Marcus as a wedding present. The property is built as a two-story Monterey block adobe with two rooms in the Hacienda Wing. We've been restoring the building since about 2002 um, in cooperation with the National Park Service for a period of time and also with the University of Vermont. Uh, they provide the expertise um, for us, for traditional um, craftsmen, for stabilizing the property as well as to um, allow us to make sure that we are consistent with the periods of significance. I'm Dick Rothwell. I'm the president of the Camp Pendleton Historical Society. We're standing on the south side of what is known as the Las Flores Adobe. <clears throat> it's on Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, about halfway between Oceanside and San Clemente. You could probably see us from the freeway if it wasn't for the vegetation. You may be able to hear some of the noise of the freeway in the background. Long before the white man came to uh, Alta, California, this was the site of an Indian village. Uh, they know it, uh, knew it as uh, Ushmai, which meant wildflower. Uh, when the Spanish came, it was known as Las Flores. When Mission San Luis Rey opened in 1798, all of Camp Pendleton and a lot of the other surrounding areas became part of the mission. It was a huge enterprise, some 900,000 square acres. And because of that, uh, rather than taking the Christianized Indians, they were called neophytes, into the mission for training and observation and uh, <clears throat> religious uh, uh, activities, they let them stay in their villages and so to speak brought the mission to them. And they built what was called an estancia in the early 1820s on a small hill just about 100 uh, meters, 200 meters behind my back. By 1823, Father Perry was building Las Flores Estancia. It was complete by 1827. The Estancia acted as a way station between San Luis Rey Mission and San Juan Capistrano. The property was occupied by Native Americans and neophytes, and it was run as a ranch to support the mission system. After the Mexican Revolution of 1821, one of, the, one of the main aims of the new government was to reduce the power of the Catholic Church, which had sided with the mother country during that battle. And that, of course, meant doing away with the missions. That was easily, more easily said than done because the missions were very important to the economy and they also was the question of what do you do with the Indians? The Franciscans uh, argued very passionate, passionately that the Indians just weren't ready to be on their own. If they were left that way, one of two things would happen. They would either revert to their pagan ways or they would become victims to a group of civilian settlers who wanted the land. They were known as Californios. <clears throat> One of the ways that the mission, or the Mexican government, tried to ease the transition of the mission's uh, Indians into uh, self-sufficiently was to give them land. So they deeded about 20,000 acres along the coastal plain of what is now Camp Pendleton to about 30 mission Indian families. They didn't own it as individuals, they owned it as a commune, each family having a share but no particular part that they could call their own. During this transition period from the missions to when it was finally uh, secularized, the Mexican government appointed civilian administrators to take care uh, of the economic side of the mission production. One of those missionary uh, those administrators was Pio Pico, along with his brothers who became the administrators of Mission San Luis Rey. When secularization finally came, the Mexican government deeded about 89,000 acres to those two brothers in what is now the southern part of Camp Pendleton. Pio Pico began to acquire other lands that had been formerly part of the mission under the name of himself and his brother in what was known as Rancho Santa Margarita. He went to Las Flores, Horno, San Mateo, but the 20,000 acres of land along the coastal plain uh, were seemingly beyond his touch because the Indians had a legal title to it. But he was up to the challenge. One of the members of the 30 families 
uh, that lived at uh, Las Flores was an Indian by the name of Pablo Apis. He had been born in Guajome, been educated at the Mission San Luis Rey, was one of the few of his people who could speak, read, and write Spanish, and he became a spokesman, very much uh, opposed uh, in a social sense to Pio Pico, who was viewed as being a very harsh and corrupt overseer, and he was speaking up for his people. <clears throat> Pio threw him in jail at one time, uh, but he still demanded uh, uh, that there be some sort of a punishment for Pio. You might say a punishment came because Pio was removed from his job uh, as, as the administrator, but very soon thereafter he received a land grant for what is now known as Rancho Santa Margarita, about 89,000 acres in the southern part of Camp Pendleton. As Pio was trying to increase his land holdings, he got together with Pablo Apis. And unfortunately, in the case of the Indians at Las Flores, the predictions of the Franciscans turned out to be correct. They just weren't able to make a financial or an economic go of it, and the village had fallen into squalor. We don't know how he convinced the people to do this, but he and Pablo got the Indians to sign over their collective rights to the land to a single member of their people, Pablo. And then, seemingly in the middle of the night, the name of Pablo Apis disappeared from the deed, and in, the in its place came the names of Pio and Andres Pico, his brother. <laughs> the Indians were shipped off to Temecula, and suddenly now, Pio and Andres Pico were the owners of 133,000 acres that included all of Camp Pendleton and the present-day Fallbrook Naval Weapon Station's annex, and it became known as Rancho Santa Margarita y Las Flores. Pio continued to own the land until 1864, and he had some financial difficulties, so he sold it to his brother-in-law, a fellow that was born in Liverpool, England, by the name of John Forster, came to uh, Alta California in Los Angeles very, uh, in his very late teens, converted to Catholicism, became a Mexican citizen, made a strategic marriage. He married the younger sister of Pio Pico, Isidore, and began using his uh, political influence to acquire property in Orange County. So when he bought the land from the Mar Santa Margarita y Las Flores from Pio Pico in 1864, the ranch now became about 220,000 acres, extending all the way from Oceanside, past the Orange County line, past San Juan Capistrano, up to include present-day Mission Viejo, Mission Santa Margarita, and Mission Rancho Mission Viejo. <clears throat> in about 1866, Don Juan Forrester, as he was then known, but that but then known, <coughs> began to build this very lovely two-story Monterey-style adobe home at the site of that former Indian village at Las Flores. Don Juan Forrester built this, this home as a uh, wedding present for his son Marcos, and they lived here until uh, 1882 when Don Juan Forrester died and his heirs decided they had to sell the ranch. They sold it to an Irishman by the name of Richard O'Neill. At least they thought they sold it to Richard because Richard had a silent partner. His name was James C. Flood. The richest man in all of California, probably one of the richest men in the world, made his money in the Comstock load. Very shortly after Richard moved into the ranch house, he received a visit from a woman by the name of Victoria McGee. Victoria had been a, born in San Diego, a member of a well-known uh, California family, the Pedro Años. <clears throat> she had married Henry, who had come to uh, California during the Mexican War as an army officer, mustered out, got married, settled down. <clears throat> the family raised eight children, and they settled on a ranch, a modest ranch, located on the western slopes of Mount Palomar. Well, one day when Victoria was in Temecula, she overheard a group of Indian vaqueros talking about rustling the cattle on O'Neill's ranch and burning his home. So she came to give him this news. O'Neill, armed with the information, got his own group of vaqueros together and put an end uh, to the scheme before it could actually be hatched. And he remained forever 
thankful to, to Victoria for the warning. Victoria got cancer and died after an operation in 1868, which left the eight children under the control of their youngest child, Jane, known as Jenny to her family. She was 24 years old at the time. Knowing about this, Richard O'Neill traveled to Condor's Nest and offered the family the use of the Las Flores Adobe, which was then vacant. Jane picked up uh, the youngest of the children, got her next to oldest sibling, her brother Hugh, who was about two years her junior, moved down here along with a lot of the animals and farm, farm implements, and began to try to make a new life raising cattle on the coastal plain. Didn't work, wasn't enough water, they were gonna sell the, the milk in Oceanside. Tried several other uh, agricultural endeavors with the same result until she finally settled on raising llama beans, which don't need so much water worked out beautifully. She became very successful, the family became very successful, and before long, it was common to find burlap bags throughout San Diego and Orange Counties with the name Jane McGee, Llama Beans, stomped on the side, and she became known as the Llama Bean Queen. In 1942, Jane McGee was 80 years old. She was still living here. And she was concerned about what would happen to her, and as were her family and her many friends in Oceanside. She knew that the President of the United States, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, was coming to Camp Pendleton the September of that year to preside at the official dedication. And her plan was to go and see the President and plead her case. Unfortunately, when the President came, uh, she was just not well enough to make the trip. So the story is that uh, the president went to see her. Whether that's true or not, we don't know, but what we do know is that he decreed that Jane McGee and the members of her family living <coughs> in the Las Flores Adobe could continue to live there for as long as that current generation survived. Jane actually outlived the, uh, the president. She died in 1948. When the Marine Corps came aboard um, Camp Pendleton, they purchased the property. Um, the Marines were here by 1942. Um, the McGee family were, was allowed to have an inholding of the property until the last descendant passed away, which is in 1968. At that time, the property was listed on the National Register as a National Historic Landmark. And after that, the, the property passed to the Marine Corps and became vacant, and it began to deteriorate until the Marine Corps was able to partner with the United States National Park Service, the University of Vermont Graduate School of Engineering, and able to stop the deterioration, begin the restoration, to have a property now that very much reflects how it was at the beginning of the Marine Corps' ownership of this camp, of Camp Pendleton, and will be a permanent remembrance of the history of this land. Currently, we are finishing a lot of the interior finish work on the rooms, and landscape will be completed in the next few years. We are having an interpretive plan developed, which will help the docents, who are a volunteer organization that um, run tours through the property, to understand how the property was used, um, placement of furniture, furnishings, all those things to help people understand the importance of this property. Currently we have tours um, available to the public. They can contact Camp Pendleton um, History Museum's office and they'll let us know that there are people interested in a tour. And it, the tours are available second Friday of every month from 10 to 2. A few miles away sits one of the other very old structures substantially rebuilt after floods in 1993 basically destroyed it. Faye Jonathan, museum director at Camp Pendleton, tells its story and that of the Santa Margarita Ranch House, for many years home of the commanding officer on the Marine Corps base. Welcome to the Rancho Santa Margarita y Las Flores. This is actually the Santa Margarita Ranch House National Historic Site. This is one of three buildings 
Uh, the first building would be, and the oldest, would be the Ranch House Chapel, what is called the chapel now. Originally it was maybe a winery, and it later became a blacksmith shop. So when the Marines came aboard base in 1942, it was a blacksmith shop. This is the uh, house that the O'Neills lived in and the Floods owned. And they, they shared that ownership uh, 20 years into their agreement and uh, split the property of the Ranch of Santa Margarita. You are on Camp Pendleton and I'd like to invite you into the house to see more of the story of the Ranch of Santa Margarita. This part of the house is the older part of the house, and so it's 1840-ish. Um, I say that because you added rooms as you needed them. So this was not necessarily the first room of the house, but it was an early room and it was a breezeway originally. And this fellow here is Don Andres Pico. He was Pio Pico's brother, and he was a military man. He fought the Americans at the Battle of San Pasqual, which is near the Wild Animal Park. And here you have Pio Pico, the last governor of Mexican California was his brother, he was a politician. He and his brother built the first two rooms of the adobe. Don Juan Forrester was an Englishman. He came here at 17 years old to the United States. He worked for his uncle, ran the San Pedro Harbor for a period of time, and eventually owned all of this ranch and much more. Okay, the armoire here is a his and hers armoire. It's a, a bride and groom armoire, some people call it. It probably came by covered wagon, uh, and it is a piece that probably, when it came, it came in pieces, and then when it was put together, these caps were hammered on at the end when it got here. And this piece was a piece that is unique because it's the only piece of furniture we know was here when President Roosevelt came through the building after the family had vacated the ranch and everything, and he came to visit and, and to name the base after General Pendleton. He saw this, probably. We are in the sala. The sala means the living room. Now in the early days the living room was a place where everybody gathered and in the early days if there was an elderly person like an elderly grandmother or something she would have her bedroom in the living room and that would be screened off in the back here and she would have her privacy but then when the family came in the screen came to the side and she was part of the family. We have pictures here of the family. So we have uh, Richard O'Neill, and we have his wife, Alice O'Neill, and then we have a gift from a great-granddaughter, Alice O'Neill Avery, who lives in Orange County and is part of Mission Viejo. She donated this painting, and it portrays the rancho in the early days, and as you can see, the part of the house has a buggy shed. That buggy shed is no longer. It is now the enclosed area where the general later on lived when we had generals living in the house. This is the oldest room of the house that you're in, or at least the one that we know the best about. And if you look from the inside of the wall here to the outside where those window braces are, then you will know how thick that brick is. This is partly how you know what is an original room and what is an, a later room. The original rooms have very thick walls because they were built by hand and built by the natives here. The other thing that shows you how it was handmade is if you look at the top of the doorway, you see it's not straight at the very top. And also, I'm gonna show you one other place here. If you look down here at the bottom, you see that the wall is separated from the wall this far away. Follow that up and you see that it gets really close together. And that proves to you that this room is really not straight. It's very much handmade. This is Isadora's bedroom, or at least we call it Isadora's bedroom. What we have now is a bedroom and a bathroom. Originally they were twin bedrooms. And in this room, we have a portrait of Don Juan Forrester, and we also have a portrait of Isadora Pico Forrester. In this room, you also have a trapdoor in the restroom. 
the story is that if you wanted to protect your young ladies, which they had a hard time doing in those 1800 times, um, there was a lot of kidnappings and so on. So what they would do is they would protect those virtues of those young ladies by uh, having them climb the ladder at night up into the trap door and be, the, tr the ladder was taken away and then morning the ladder was put back up. The beams are rough hewn beams as you can see and they probably came from Mount Palomar. That's the only wood that was uh, growing in the region and in the early days uh, these would have been dragged behind the wagons until they were rounded and put into place and the ones that were used at Mission San Luis Rey would have been uh, once they were blessed, they were put into place, they weren't allowed to touch the ground again. We believe that these beams may have come from Mission San Luis Rey when secularization took place. In around 1860, during Forrester's time, they added this room to the house. He kept adding rooms as, as needed. So if you look at the window seal, you'll see that it's not as deep as some of the original window, window frames that you saw earlier that were Pio Pico time period. And so we know that this was built much later. One of the things that we have in this room that fortunate to have is the family donated back uh, Jerome O'Neill's desk and chair. And then we also have a portrait of General Pendleton that was donated by his wife when the base was opened in 1942. This is the President's Room, and this room is called that because when President Roosevelt came to Camp Pendleton to name the base after General Pendleton, uh, he took an hour tour through the house. And we have a portrait here, a photograph here, showing him in his automobile getting out to see the house. And he spent about an hour here. And so when he came in this room, it was empty. There was nothing in it. None of the things that you see here were here. And he said, you know, this room is charming. Save it for the next ex-president of the United States, thinking that he would get to see this room. And ever afterwards, when the help came in or the Marines came in to clean or whoever was in here, they referred to this room as the President's Room because it was his favorite room on that tour. This room would have been uh, probably built in the 1860s during the Forster period. And during that period, Isadora, his wife, Pio's sister, uh, entertained uh, people into the room at, for worship. And so in honor of that, there is a display here of a kneeler, a prie dieu, if you would like, and a rosary from the mission, and a painting that's a 16th century painting on wood. This is one of the last rooms of the, of the ranch house. It is the cowboy room, and it's called that because the cowboys used to come in from the bunkhouse through that door and sit at long plank tables. There was rough hewn floor wood um, below their feet and had their breakfast, lunch, and dinner here when they weren't out in the field with the cows. So this was an interesting room for these uh, cowboys to come in and eat. Later, this became the general's quarters, and that's why you now see furniture in here and a white carpet and white drapery. I hope you enjoy your tour of the Ranch of Santa Margarita and would like to come sometime in the future. We are open, generally speaking, from September through May every year, uh, first Tuesday, second Wednesday, and third Thursday. This program was made possible by a generous grant from the Parker Foundation. Gerald and Inez Parker.